that you would bless it and multiply it in Jesus' name. Use it for your glory, for the furtherance of your kingdom, we ask. Amen. So that's happening this afternoon after church. Uh, so like I said, if you can stay and help, we'd appreciate it. Um, the garage sale is Wednesday all the way through Saturday. It's from 8 to 5, Wednesday through Friday, and 8 to 1 on Saturday. Any help that we could get just manning the sale is greatly, greatly appreciated. Just folding clothes that have been unfolded by people or, you know, that kind of thing. Um, bringing stuff in that people donate because people always donate stuff during the week. Uh, as they find out we're having a garage sale, they bring in more stuff, which is great, but we need help kind of sorting. Stuff like that. And I think that will be... Our only announcement for this week. Kids, you can go ahead and go to your classes. We love you. We're grateful that you are here with us. Go learn. Yeah, give them a big round of applause, everybody. Our beautiful children. We love so much. Nursery is also open, just in case it wasn't open when you walked in. I'm going to try and stand, but it's not easy right now. Um, <laughs> I feel weird because I don't know. I mean, seriously, is anybody else there or is this just me? Yeah? Okay, good, good. Elizabeth's back there going, yeah, absolutely. Maybe it was just on the stage. You should, guys should all just come out up here and hang out. Um, uh, oh, thank you, Brian. You're, you're a beautiful man of God. I'm grateful. <laughs> um, I just, my legs feel like complete water uh, right now. Yeah, right. Uh, there was a good friend of mine back during the back during the the renewal in the '90s, the end of the '90s. Yes, I'm that old, people. Um, uh, who wrote a song called "Let the Mighty River Come and Take Me Away," and we used to sing it ad nauseum. But uh, the uh, it was a picture from from Ezekiel of the river that got deeper the further it went, and and and. Uh, the chorus is, let the river overwhelm me and pick me up right off my feet. Take me spinning around as love surrounds me and all I can do is sing. It's a good song. We should probably bring that back maybe. But, uh, and we saw days like that quite often where the river of God would pour into the room and we would be carried away and we didn't, there was nothing else to do. This morning we're going to talk about purpose. But let's pray. Father, guide our time this morning. Speak your word. Lord, I pray that you would accomplish more by your spirit than I could ever hope to accomplish with my words or my abilities, Lord. Let something be birthed in this room today that changes each of us and changes this church and changes this region, we ask in Jesus' name. And Lord, if you want to come so overwhelm us that there's, that there's nothing that I can do, Lord, you're welcome to do that. I don't want to stop you. You, oh God, we want you. So 
This morning when I woke up, the Lord gave me a sermon I had not prepared. Which happens sometimes, you know, I sit and wait on the Lord. And we make, I make plans with the leadership of the Holy Spirit for what we're going to do each week. And um, usually many weeks ahead of time, I'm already thinking through and praying through what God wants to say. And, but every once in a while, the Lord will wake me up on Sunday morning or even in the middle of worship. Thankfully, it was this morning, not middle of worship. Uh, and give me something else. And I heard the Lord say this morning, I want to talk about purpose. I had a different... We were going to go a different way, but I, I, this is what the Lord wants to do. You and I, we are human beings and we were created with a deep need for purpose. And there's a question that is buried in the heart of every human being, and that question is, why? 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 I used to get in trouble for asking my mother that question. Clean your room. Why? Because it's dirty. Yeah, but why does that matter? Eventually we got to the, the classic parental phrase, because I said so, which I am of a firm belief that's good enough. I don't have time to entertain your, your questions. The answer is because I said so. And I'm sure God would, God would say that to us sometimes. <laughs> Why do you want me to do that? Because I said so. Just do it. Belief is, or faith sometimes means doing things that we don't understand. And that's okay. It happens. But God, we are not meant to live our lives with no understanding of why we exist or why we are walking on the face of the earth at any given time. We were meant to be filled up with a deep understanding of our purpose as individuals. We were meant to be a people who get it. And God's people, especially more than anyone else, should be a people who get it, who understand, who have a sense of the why. Who aren't confused most of the time about why we're doing the things that we're doing. The history of human thought is the history of pursuing this question. And I am not a philosophy major. But I have read a bit. And I know a bit. And I think back through all of the different philosophical schemes, all the way back to the ancient Greeks, and they began to pursue this question, why? Why are we here? Why do we exist? What are we supposed to be doing? They came up with the answer, we exist so we might understand. That was, their, that was their answer. Which is a nice self-serving answer because as a philosopher, I exist to philosophize. That is the purpose of my existence. Therefore, you should pay us to do this. Right? Does that make sense? I exist... In, or, you know, that, yeah, anyway, be, to do what I enjoy doing, which is think deeply about thinking. But there's been a whole bunch of other ideas ever since then as we move down through the history of, of human thought. We get to, you know, we exist to serve. That was a good one. That was one that, that, uh, that, that they had. We exist to conquer. That was the Roman understanding. We exist to conquer. That's why we exist, to conquer. Well, that makes so much sense. We exist to cover the world with Roman culture. And as we move forward, we come to the Enlightenment, which was 
This nation was birthed out of a philosophical movement referred to as the Enlightenment, which is the child of the Renaissance. I don't know if you guys know anything about history or not, but this is your brief, your brief philosophical historical lesson for the month. I promise we won't go there again. But right around the 1700s, 1750s, you know, that, that, that realm, everybody was talking about that humanity existed for the pursuit of happiness, that we exist to pursue that which will bring us joy. And we believed it so much in this country that we put it into our founding documents, right? The, de the Declaration of Independence, what does it say? That, that, that human beings have rights that, you can't be, that can't be taken away. They're inalienable. That means they can't be taken away. And among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Still a whole lot of us believe that one. Our modern culture, thanks to, thanks to advertising and rampant consumerism, our modern culture really, truly, honestly believes at its core that we exist to consume to spend and to acquire wealth to maintain the economy. That's, that is, by the way, if you are offended by that statement, I want you to think about it for a while. It is the religion of the United States of America, not, not long followed up by militarism, which is something else. It's, 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 it's the little brother of consumerism. I exist to obtain wealth and to create wealth for others, and therefore I need a large army to protect my stuff. That's militarism. And that's those two things sitting next to each other are the religion of the United States of America writ large. But Jesus had an alternate answer, and Jesus had an alternate answer that goes back farther than his ministry 2,000 years ago. It goes back all the way to the beginning. Jesus had an answer that is simultaneously incredibly simple and ridiculously complex. It's an answer that was given to us when we first were created, and it's an answer that was given to us when God made his, his, uh, his, his covenant with Abraham, and it's an answer that was given to us when God made his covenant with Moses, and it was an answer that was most, most brought forth, most powerfully and explicitly in the words of Jesus when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he answered them, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. You see, all those other ideas about purpose, all those other ideas about why we exist, they were all flawed. Because they all did the same thing. They all pointed our existence inward. That my existence is is. Sustain is meant to be sustained by me and for me. That I exist in order to exist. That my life is about me. And depending on who was teaching you that, that would come out in different ways. If a philosopher taught you that, then they would teach you that your life is about thinking and you need to be thinking and that's why. Why? Because that's his favorite thing to do and that resonates with him. If you are the Roman Empire and you have enough power to bully the world, then you're going to tell the world that, that the world exists to perpetuate Roma, right? If you were... Depending, it all depended on who was in power and who was the one talking to you, but it was always the same thing. My existence is the point of existence. But we are not, we are different than that. 
And we go back to the very reality as to why humanity was invented in the first place, why we exist. And it is simple and beautiful, but we will spend the rest of our lives trying to learn how to do it. And that is we exist to love and be loved by God and by each other, for God and for each other. Pastor Brian Zahn says it like this. He says, life is not a game, it's a gift. And the point of life is not to win, but to learn to love well. That is why we exist. And you want to know why that's why we exist? Because it was love that created us. And love created us for love. When we, when we hear the voice of God the Father say, let us make man in our own image, there's so many things connected to that and so many different ways that we can interpret that. But the most obvious one is this. God, who is love, created us to be love as well. And we can't be called in his image if we are not lovers ourselves and beloved. You see, the nature that we have been told about God, this is who God is. God is a community of Father, Son, and Spirit who have in eternity past, that means this has always been true. There was never a time when this wasn't true. He has always been this way. God Father has loved God Son, has loved God Spirit, has loved God Father, has loved God Son, has loved God Spirit, and they have existed in this beautiful eyeball-to-eyeball great delight, love, and rejoicing of one another, constantly flowing, giving, pouring out of themselves into the other, constantly loving, giving, emptying themselves for the other, always and always and always and always and always. That's who he is. Did you know that God was a community? Because he is. Three who are one. God is that in ways that are much deeper and much more profound than we can possibly understand with our puny human minds. But this is what scripture reveals and this is what the church proclaims, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and that they are of the same essence, one with the other, that not, none of them is over the other and that they have existed in perpetual unity and desire and passion for one another. So when God creates, do you think that something of that community isn't going to exist in every single thing that God creates. And the more we learn about how nature and the universe work, the more we learn how intimately connected all things are to one another, the more we learn about how everything in this universe operates and moves and has its being, the more we see the love that exists in the Godhead reflected in the very nature of existence. You ready for my nerdiest statement yet today? I know very little about physics and even less about quantum mechanics but here's something unbelievable. Did you know that things behave differently when they are observed than they do when they are not observed? That's a scientific fact. Do you know what that means? That means your presence changes the nature of the universe. Whoa. Think about that for a second. Why? Because all of creation exists in relationship with itself and with God. That's the truth. And then when God got to what would be the pinnacle of his creation, mankind, 
He created a being just like him that was meant to exist in this same kind of way, in this same kind of space, in this same kind, in the, to exist in the same way that he exists, in that we are meant to be in relationship with each other and with him. That the purpose of our existence is relationship with each other and with him. That's what love is. So what does that mean and what does that look like? I think I'm okay now. It means the glory of God is most fully displayed in a people who are living their lives for this one purpose, to love God and to love the people around them. Jesus said it this way. He said, they will know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. That the mark of a person who's living their life as a follower of Jesus would be love for humanity for people. So let's bring this down out of the lofty clouds of my, semi, my quasi-philosophical mind and let's bring it down to our everyday life and existence. Why did you get up this morning? Why does your heart continue to beat? Why do you continue to breathe air? Why do you do the things that you do in order to maintain your existence? There should be a why behind all that. And the human answer has always been, basically, the fear of death. That's been the human answer from the beginning. The human answer from the beginning is, I do what it takes to keep myself existing because I'm afraid of what it's going to look like when I cease to exist. I keep eating because I don't want to die. I keep breathing because I don't want to die. I, my heart keeps beating because I don't want to die. But see, that's not good enough because we're all going to die. There is going to be a very, very few people who are going to be resurrected before their death at the second coming of Jesus if we are, if we are going to think about that. But that is, if you think about the percentage, <laughs> that is a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage. The reality is most of us, including every person in this room at this moment, we are going to experience physical death. If our reason to stay alive is just to stay alive, then we are all failing. Our purpose is useless. It can't be a purpose. There must be purpose beyond this life. There must be purpose beyond the things that end at death. It can't be that we're supposed to get a bunch of wealth because guess what? Everyone with a bunch of wealth will tell you the same thing. They're still not satisfied. Did you know that the wealthiest people in the world today are the wealthiest people that have ever existed in the history of mankind? Are you aware of that? And they will tell you we're not okay. It's not enough. They have moved all the way. They have the greatest success in, the, in our consumeristic philosophical plan, idea. They're the winners, the big winners. And they'll tell you it means nothing. It's empty. It's no, there is no, there is nothing. Because we were meant for more than this. We were meant to love and be loved. And not 
not just by each other, although that is absolutely the case. We were meant, we are created, we exist to love God and to love each other. The Westminster Catechism says the purpose of man is to love God and enjoy him forever. I think that's interesting, but you forgot love each other, and Jesus cared a lot about that one. They talk about it later in the, in the catechism, but it's not nearly as important as the first. Jesus didn't like to say one without the other, which is why he never would. So if love is our purpose, if that's why we exist, if we woke up, if we wake up every day and our heart keeps beating every day and we keep breathing every day because God created us to love and be loved, that should change the way our lives work, should it not? Shouldn't that be the goal behind going to work where we go to work or behind uh, the things that we involve ourselves in, behind the things that we ask our children to be involved in or allow our children to be involved in? You know what? The purpose behind your life is to love and be loved. So let's think about how this thing that you want to do is going to serve that purpose. It isn't that there are things that we should say, well, I mean, unless they're purposefully harmful things. It isn't that there are things that we would say, no, that doesn't align with the purpose of loving to be loved, so you shouldn't do it. The beautiful thing about this purpose is that it can be interwoven into every single thing that our hands, our hearts, and our minds find to do. Because whatever you do, do it, whether eat or drink, do it to the glory of God. This is who we are. So it doesn't matter what you're up to right now. If you're working in a factory, if you're working in a school, if you're working in a hospital, if you're retired, if you are in school, if you are, it doesn't matter what you're doing right now. The purpose of what you're doing is to love and be loved. So find a way to do that right where God's placed you because you are not in the place that God has placed you on accident. You are where you are because God led you there. And in that place, you are empowered by the Holy Spirit that dwells inside of you to live out a purpose much deeper and more unshakable than anything any of the people around you might understand. And that is you are there to love God and be loved by God. You are there to love the people that you see every day and be loved by them. Now, that's not always easy. There are definitely, there are people that are easy to love. There really are. There are people that are so easy to love. The minute you meet them, you're like, I like you. You're great. I, you know, it's not hard to love you. But then there are people that you're like, really? You want me to love that guy? Oh. Not sure how I feel about that, Lord. Ah. But that's your purpose. Let me help you. Your purpose is not to put money away in a a savings account or a retirement account, although it's wise to do both of those things. Your purpose is not to buy more and more toys, although that doesn't mean God is opposed to that kind of thing all the time. Your purpose is not to in, indulge yourself in hobbies so that you can speak Elvish or Klingon or, although maybe, who knows? I mean, that's okay. I'm not saying any of those things are evil or wrong. What I'm saying is those aren't your purpose. Your purpose is to love and be loved. And if you can do those things and cause them to serve the purpose for which you were created, then not only will it glorify God, but it will be satisfying to your soul. Because that's the most beautiful thing about the purpose that God's given us is that it's the only way for us to live as satisfied, joyful human beings is to walk out the purpose for which God created us, which is to love him and love each other. And if we don't know how to do that, 
We're always going to be depressed. We're always going to be filled with anxiety. We're always going to think just a little bit more or just, or this is a failure or it doesn't matter. There's lots of different ways that we can go with, but it's never going to be right. And it's never going to feel, you're never going to experience the joy that comes from being a purpose driven person, a person who lives in the flow of the purpose for which you were created. Let me tell you something else about this. When you live in the flow of the purpose for which you were created, changes in your life are not nearly as scary as they were before. Because if your purpose is to have a lot of money or a lot of things and then something happens to your finances, uh, your purpose is threatened and that is a very scary place to be. But if your purpose is to love and be loved, then finances or no finances, you can still do that. If your purpose is to rise to the top of the corporate ladder or whatever ladder it is where, you, where your particular work is, and somebody is there that, that they want to rise to the top of the corporate ladder and sees you as an enemy, right? If they, then there's going to, you know, you're going to get into some kind of war between the two of you and it's, it's going to be ugly. You're going to hate that person. You know, they're going to be, and, and you're going to be filled with, with anger and hatred towards the person that's the obstacle to you moving to where your purpose is calling you to move. But if you understand what Jesus has told you is the truth, that your purpose isn't to rise anywhere, your purpose is to love and be loved, then you recognize that people cannot be obstacles to that purpose. People are your purpose. And the reason that person is standing opposite you with all of his anger and, 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 and venom towards you is because God wants to show that person love in a way that they have never received. It's amazing how the power of the Holy Spirit can move into adversarial relationships and create something beautiful there when, guess what, I'm not a threat to you. I am a friend. Because my purpose is to love you, not to earn that job or be in that corner office or does this make sense? Let's prepare to come to the table of the Lord this morning. If I can have a few folks willing to hop up. I'm gonna read from Ephesians chapter 1 or maybe Philippians 3. I'm not sure. What are we going to do? Let's do that. Philippians 3, 7. But whatever gains, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Go ahead and start passing those out. If you need gluten-free, just raise your hand and um, I'll have somebody bring that to you. What is the prize that Paul's talking about? What is the call 
It's this simple call. It's this simple prize. It's of fulfilling the purpose for which I was created. It is loving and being loved. That's it. He says, I want to know Jesus. I want to love Jesus more than I ever have before. I want to have, I want to have all of him, and I want him to have all of me. And that's the purpose for which I was created, and that is the purpose to which I am called. And I am going to pursue it no matter what, and I'm leaving everything else behind because that's where I'm headed. And I don't care about anything else. I want Jesus. I want to be loved by him, and I want to love him. And he already loves me, but I don't love him nearly enough. And not only that, I don't love you nearly enough. And so I'm going to keep pressing forward because I've been called for a purpose. And that purpose is to love and be loved. You see, we were created for a purpose. We continue to live because of that purpose. And we were saved for a purpose. And everything we do in this life is meant to serve a purpose. As we come to the table of the Lord this morning, I want us to think about that purpose. Because the purpose that should guide every step of us, I still need the bread, guys. I need, I need the bread. I didn't get a piece. Christine needs one, too. Christine, thank you very much. In the red coat up there. And if you didn't get, if you didn't get one of the elements, just raise your hand. Over here, guys. Christine, just wave at him. Did you get it? Right here. These two. You see, the purpose that God created you for is the same purpose that Jesus died for. It's reality. When we come to the table of the Lord, we are remembering the Lord's death until he comes. Why did Jesus die? Jesus died because he loved his father and because he loved you. And Jesus' death enables you to be free from the power of death and sin so that you can pursue the very same purpose for which Jesus died, to love God and to love each other. You see, this is the table of, not of the church, but of the Lord. And it's made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long, come. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come. For it is the Lord who invites you. And it is his will that those who would meet him would meet him right here. Our purpose begins with Jesus' cross. Begins here. In the sacrifice of our loving Savior. Let's consider the bread this morning. Lord, we thank you that you came in the flesh. You came in person. You came to be face to face. You didn't stay far away. You didn't send an angel or a servant. You came to be with us. Not only that, you came to be one of us. And you are calling us into the very purpose for which your body was broken. And so, Lord, as we take this into ourselves, Lord, we are taking on again that purpose to which 
and for which you died. We say this morning by taking this that we will be like you. We will go in ourselves. We will move in close. We will love people ourselves, not by means of an, of an intermediary, not by we are going to go face to face just like you did. Just as you were incarnate, so we shall be incarnate and we shall be your love to them every day as you empower us. We receive that power this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take it together. And Jesus, here is your blood, the blood of the new covenant, the high price that was paid to defeat sin and death, to release resurrection life. Lord, we need you. Because you didn't leave that commandment at love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. You added to it at the end. You said, love one another as I have loved you. We hold in our hands the very reality, the very picture of just how far you will go to fulfill the great purpose of love and just how far you're calling us to go. Lord, we can't do it ourselves. And I thank you that we are only accomplishing it as we are in Christ. So we receive this covenant with all of our hearts and in faith that we will learn to love as we are taught by the one who laid down his life for his friends. Thank you, Jesus. Let us receive it together. Let's stand. These altars are open. I'm always excited and willing and ready to pray for anybody that wants to receive prayer. But as we go out from this place, let us carry with us the purpose for which we were created and the purpose for which we continue to live. So I bless you in the name of Jesus to love God and love each other. I bless you not to see men and women as obstacles to the purpose for which you were created, but to see them as opportunities to carry out the purpose for which God gave you life. I bless you to see with the eyes of Jesus as you walk through the world. And pour out and give forth of your life that others might live. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, well, we are going to, the first thing we need to do is clear the chairs. Um, so, well.